Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> you don't have to repeat everything I say, um, but uh, my name is Hank Clark. You definitely don't want to repeat that. And um, I'm the program director for the Political Economy Project, and it's a great joy to see all of you here this afternoon. Let me just say a word or two about upcoming activities at the, uh, at the PEP. We have an event exactly a week from today, the 21st of January, at 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Students from Doug Irwin and Marjorie Rose's uh, Econ 70 immer Immersion course, uh, where they went to uh, Argentina in December, will be uh, here to share their reports, their experiences with all of you. Uh, and uh, you're welcome to attend that. That will be in this room, Rocky 2, at uh, 6 p.m. If any of you are not on the PEP mailing list but would like to be, you can either uh, check us out on the uh, PEP website or you can uh, jot down your name and uh, email address uh, on this uh, handy white pad that I brought uh, with me. But now to today's event. Uh, Shruti Rajagopalan is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University and a fellow at the Classic Liberal Institute in, uh, at uh, New York University School of Law. She's also associate professor of economics at uh, SUNY Purchase. Uh, currently on leave. Uh, Shruti received her uh, PhD in economics from George Mason University in uh, 2013, and she has other degrees from the universities of Delhi in India, as well as the universities of Hamburg, Ghent, and Bologna. Her main area of interest is the economic analysis of comparative legal and political systems, especially law and economics, public choice theory, and constitutional economics. Her work has been published in peer-reviewed journals, law reviews, and books. She has a fortnightly column called The Impartial Spectator and Mint, and her popular writing on Indian political economy has appeared in the New York Times, Washington, excuse me, the uh, Wall Street uh, Journal, Mint, the Hindu Business Line, and the Indian Express. And she is also a newly minted expert on Adam Smith because both of us survived a week in Holland, Michigan this past summer, studying and talking about Adam Smith together. And uh, uh, so that, that's where I met Shruti. And um, so it's a real pleasure to have her with us today. Won't you please join me in welcoming Shruti Rajagopalan. Uh. Thank you so much, Hank. Uh, as Hank mentioned, we spent a week together. It's called the Adam Smith Boot Camp. Uh, it felt like a boot camp. And uh, he was our drill sergeant, <laughs> though a very kind one. Uh, he was our discussion leader. Uh, thank you also to Professor Wellborn. John and I were in graduate school together, sitting in a class not very different from this, trying not to fail <laughs> macro theory or whatever it was at the time. Uh, so it's really, really wonderful to be here. Uh, I got lost a little bit on campus just because it's so pretty and everything is worth looking at. So, so it's really nice to be here. Um, today I want to talk to you uh, from a comparative perspective about the eminent domain power in India and the United States. Right? This is also colloquially referred to as the takings clause, right? taking which literally means the right to take property. Um, I want to touch on four sort of broad themes with you. This is a picture of uh, a recent case. This was uh, Kilo versus City of New London. Uh, Suzette Kilo had a pink house, right? And this is sort of the, uh, uh, lots of newspapers published this cartoon of, you know, the state trying to take her little pink house. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the evolution of the takings clause in the United States. Then I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of the takings clause in India though the time periods are quite different with a little bit of overlap. And then, you know, a brief comparison, which will sort of happen through the talk, but, you know, we can, we can zero in on some 
really critical points of comparison and perhaps wrap it up with the kinds of lessons one can learn for political economy or public policy uh, and so on. Um, I see many of you taking notes. If this is for a class, I can just send you my slides. So, you know, that's one, one less thing, uh, if that makes it better. So, and I believe you guys are studying uh, Chinese political economy in this class, right? So this picture will be familiar to you. This is actually a picture from China. These kinds of properties or homes are called stuck nails. Uh, I don't want to uh, try the Chinese translation. I'm, I'm probably gonna mess it up. And you can see what's going on here, right? They've literally built uh, a public street around a private home. And this is the classic holdout problem, right? Someone, they were trying to assemble pieces of land to build a public road and someone held out and did not want to give up their property to the government, right? And just one look at this also tells you how inefficient this is, right? It doesn't look appropriate for the people living in this property or doing business in this property. Like there's no zebra crossing, like what are they going to do? You know, it's, it's kind of messy. It also looks like a terrible accident, hazardous zone attempting something like this. So overall we can see that this is not very economically efficient, right? And this photograph sort of is the metaphor for the classic reason for the takings doctrine anywhere in the world, which is very often decentralized market processes do not lead to public goods for two reasons. One is the free rider problem, right? They can benefit from the public good anyway. The second is the holdout problem, which is they do not wish to give up their private property that they enjoy in order to assemble the parcel of land that is required for the public good, right? And this is the reason uh, to improve on this kind of inefficient outcome that various governments across the world, often constitutionally, have the power to take property, right? And this picture sort of uh, encompasses all of it. It's from China. There's, if you Google China eminent domain stuck nail homes, you will, and, and go to images, you will see a bunch of these homes, right? And what the Chinese government has done is try to make an example of these people. They've created a circumstance where they literally cannot use this property anymore, right? So it's sort of a, we showed you <laughs> a Chinese uh, style version of, uh, of giving in to holdouts, right? Now, the US takings clause embodies this, but at the same time, any of you have read the Federalist Papers, 51, so on, you know that when you give the state the power for anything, including eminent domain, it's important to impose restrictions and curb that power, right? And the American Takings Clause is a classic version of that. It says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation, right? So in this, we know that the government has the power to take the property, but it has certain limits which are inbuilt into this clause. Right? The first part of that is taken, right? So what is, what does it mean uh, to be taken, right? What is a takings or what qualifies as a takings? And sort of the first 40, 50 years were pretty boring in this jurisprudence. Um, there's a, you know, it was ratified, the Fifth Amendment was ratified in 1791 and uh, Barron versus the City Council of Baltimore this is a case which is quite interesting. It tells you the limits of the takings clause because Chief Justice Marshall said that the limits on the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states, right? Now this obviously changes eventually with the ratification of the 14th Amendment and the American Civil War and so on and so forth. But in 1833, uh, the takings clause and the limits to the takings clause did not apply to the states thanks to this case. The second case is more interesting because it's very unique to American jurisprudence. This is Pennsylvania Coal versus Mahon. This is a great case. It's basically a coal company in Pennsylvania which has uh, retained the below surface rights for mining and it sold the above surface rights to various people to build homes and businesses and so on. And the Pennsylvania legislature uh, prohibited, they passed a statute prohibited, uh, prohibiting mining under surfaces which have homes and streets and public assembly areas and so on, right? So basically the entire purpose of the coal company buying and retaining below surface rights got frustrated. And they went to the court, this went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said that this is as if a takings had taken place even though there was no transfer of property from private hands to the government. So 1922 Pennsylvania Coal is the beginning of what we call the doctrine of regulatory takings, 
right? So the regulation has reduced the value of the property right to such an extent that it is as if the property right had been condemned and physically taken. And therefore, it is a compensable uh, sort of, of I, I don't want to say offense, but it's like a compensable case within the takings jurisprudence. So this also qualifies as a takings. So since 1922, it's been pretty obvious what constitutes a takings in the United States, and now it applies to all 50 states, right? The second aspect of the takings clause is public use, right? And now this is a big question. What do we mean by public use, or rather what do the judges mean by public use? And in American jurisprudence, again, again there have been two time periods. The first 150 odd years were like really slow, boring, humdrum, right? It's a very narrow view of what constitutes public use. It's typically public goods, right? These are goods provided by the government, like public roads, bridges, railroads. And they also included these similar goods if they were provided by private carriers as long as they were acting like a state actor, right? So if it's a private railroad, that is still within the domain of public use, right? Now, post-1954, and we're going to walk through this evolution in a little more detail, uh, we get a slightly broader version of public use, right? What do we mean when we say we're going to take a particular piece of property and use it for the public, right? Is it only restricted to taking land and building roads or building a bridge? Or does it also accommodate other kinds of uses that the government may wish? So the first in this case is Berman v. Parker. This is 1954. This is a case in, of redevelopment in a condemned neighborhood in Washington, DC. In this particular case, the plaintiff was the owner of a small departmental store. And his particular piece or uh, land parcel was not condemned, but it was in the general area that was condemned. And the idea was that this entire neighborhood would be redeveloped under this particular statute. It would be given to a private redeveloper, like a you know, classic private real estate developer. And they would turn the neighborhood around. They would you know, make sure that the buildings were up to code. Right, the area wasn't blighted anymore. They would bring in some businesses and some jobs and really make this like a nice, shiny, pretty place, right? Now, there are a few other undertones going on in this case because this particular neighborhood, including the plaintiff, was almost entirely occupied by African-Americans, right? So when the city decided to do this, it forcibly, basically, evicted about 5,000 African Americans in that area. And even some of the neighboring areas that weren't condemned were very strong sort of neighborhoods with lots of minorities living there. So this also had a sort of like social um, unrest within that particular area. This case and this statute was widely regarded at the time as racist, right? But what happened in the Supreme Court had nothing to do with any of this. They were narrowly focused on, does this kind of redevelopment uh, fall within the purview of public use, or does it not fall within the purview of public use, right? And in this particular case, Justice Douglas said that public use includes public purpose, right? So you can immediately see there's an expansion there. And what do we mean by public use? That was, you know, pretty strict, you know, state monopoly situation, public goods situations. Public purpose is clearly a little bit wider, right? Now, obviously, the question comes up, what constitutes public purpose? And the court said, whatever the legislature says is public purpose constitutes public purpose, right? This is a different doctrine. It's called the doctrine of legis legislative deference. There is a huge literature on this, not just in the United States, but across the world. And um, Justice Douglas concluded, and, I'm, and now I quote, the role of the judiciary in determining whether eminent domain is being exercised for a public purpose is an extremely narrow one. If the legislature has spoken, the public interest has been declared in terms well nay conclusive, right? So now, if the legislature says this is public purpose, right, we're going to redevelop this area and it's going to benefit the public, we believe you, we will allow it, right? That's kind of where he left things. This was a major departure from the previous 150 years of uh, takings jurisprudence. But this broad version just continues after 1954. Right? This is Pole Town versus City of Detroit. Uh, Pole Town is a town in Michigan. This is a place where uh, General Motors wanted to expand and, uh, you know, place like a new auto industrial plant and all the ancillary 
things that go with it. Uh, there were, of course, uh, major problems because 4,000 residents of Pole Town had to be relocated forcibly because of this. And once again, the question of public purpose or public use arose, right? Is it really public use when it's general motors? Now we're not even talking about a blighted neighborhood where you could make some kind of externality argument, right? This is just pure and simple private takings from regular folks who live in Pole Town and giving it to general motors, right? Now, once again, the usual arguments were made about how, you know, uh, and you know this from lots of cities, industrial cities in the Rust Belt, where the entire political economy of a particular small town revolved around a particular factory or a particular kind of, uh, you know, economic activity that was taking place. This was still very much in vogue in the 1980s. So the idea that General Motors would set up a plant there, there would be lots of jobs and it would create these huge spillover benefits like tax revenue and so on and so forth, that held a lot of weight with uh, the judges. And they basically said that yes, economic redevelopment of this area is part of public use in the in public use limits undertakings, right? So once again, you see that this keeps getting broader. First, we talk about blighted neighborhoods and externalities, right? Then we sort of move it a little bit more and we say, now we're also talking about pure private takings as long as there's economic development. Now, once again, this gets even bigger. This is a great case. It's Hawaii Housing Authority versus Midkiff. This is 1984. This is in a small island of Ahu. I, I think I'm saying that right, uh, in, in Hawaii. The situation in this particular island was 22 landowners, not 22%, 22 individual landowners owned 72.5% of the fee simple titles in that area, right? So this was considered a really vast inequality in land ownership. Land ownership was highly concentrated. Uh, the, the legislature passed this particular statute saying that there was kind of an oligopoly when it came to land redevelopment and therefore land prices. These 22 individuals colluded and they sort of, you know, kept land prices high. They were excluding other sorts of landowners who wanted to enter the market and so on and so forth. So now we are just going to do full-scale land reform, right? You guys are studying the Chinese economy. You know a thing or two about land reform. Right? Land reform is a very classic Soviet style. You take land from rich people or feudal lords or pre-existing czars in a particular kind of feudal structure, and you redistribute that land over a large number of people, typically landless farmers. Right? This happened in China, this happened in India, it's happened in the Soviet Union, and this happened in Hawaii. Right? Even though it wasn't for farming, it was just a simple case. They said, we need to break up the oligopoly, and breaking up this oligopoly is public purpose and therefore public use, right? So you can see now we're taking one more step in broadening this kind of public use juris jurisprudence uh, within the takings clause. Uh, the court upheld it in both Berman v. Parker and uh, Hawaii v. Midkiff. Uh, it was a unanimous Supreme Court opinion, right? Uh, I think in Berman v. Park, it was eight justices at the time on the court, so it was 8-0, and this was uh, unanimous. So you can see that there, this idea that there's this economic inequality or the need for economic redevelopment or jobs or tax revenue during those years had a lot of weight uh, with the judges. Now, if you go back and look at Pole Town, you see that the redevelopment really didn't take place, right? You go back and look at this particular island in Hawaii, and what you see is the land was redistributed. The new landowners, who were, you know, like the small landowners, right? Not the, not the guys that the land was taken from, they kind of held out until land prices inflated again, and then they sold it to Japanese redevelopers. That is sort of the, the uh, ending of the Midkiff story. Right? Um, this brings us to the most recent version of this problem, which is Kilo versus City of New London. Uh, this happened not that far from where we are standing, right? The City of New London in Connecticut. This was a case where, once again, an area was uh, falling into economic decline. So there were certain parts of the neighborhood that were condemned. And the idea was that it would be given to Pfizer, the pharmaceutical company, to redevelop that area by doing a few things. So Pfizer promised to bring in one of the research facilities, 
But because, you know, when Pfizer's research facilities come, then they also need a convention center and a conference center and a hotel and, you know, a host of other things, right? So the idea was Pfizer would come and redevelop this area and there would be a whole new number of jobs and a lot of redevelopment and so on and so forth. Once again, there was a lot of unrest within the city of New London because remember, unlike Pole Town, which was still very much a factory thinking about generating jobs for, you know, the working class people in Pole Town, regular folks in the city of New London would have never gotten a job at Pfizer, right? So this was an even more egregious case of, we're going to take from you all the spillover benefits that we're talking about are not going to go to you. Right? They're going to go to someone else. They're going to be these new research scientists who are going to come into this area and their kids are going to go to good schools and they're going to use this convention center. And there'll be a few other ancillary jobs, you know, at the golf course and waitressing, which are going to be available for the city of New London. So this caused, as you can imagine, quite a lot of social problems. Uh, one particular uh, individual, her name is Suzette Kilo, held out and said, I refuse to sell my property. I'm extremely attached to it. You know, I moved here in a particular set of circumstances. I looked after my mother here. She had huge emotional attachment to that particular property. And she went all the way to the Supreme Court in this particular case, and she lost, right? Now, once again, the argument in Kilo versus City of New London was the economic development argument. Right? And there were numbers and facts and figures given on how many new jobs will be generated, right? how much tax revenue is going to come in, how the city of New London will be completely turned around. Blueprints are presented. right? It looks like this, the before and after that you see on HGTV. Right? That's the kind of before and after that was presented for the entire city of New London. So these arguments held, but unlike previous cases where it was a unanimous verdict, this was a very narrow verdict. Right? This was 5-4. So five justices said, yes, this constitutes public purpose and public use under the takings clause, and four said no. And in particular, uh, this is a 2005 case, so it's a little bit dated. Uh, uh, justices Sandra Day O'Connor and Justice Thomas both gave really vociferous uh, dissents in this particular case, right? Uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, I remember this throwaway line. I don't think I've got it exactly right. She said, if this kind of takings, this kind of private takings constitutes public purpose and therefore public use, then nothing stops the government from taking over every Motel 6 and turning it into a Ritz-Carlton, right? So she kind of really got to the heart of this is really robbing poor folks and telling them that they're not as valuable economically in a particular political economy and giving it to richer folks who we think are more valuable. And there is something really problematic about that. She held that it is OK to extend public use into public purpose in the case of blight, as it was in Berman v. Parker. Right? So she still wanted to hold on to the 1954 jurisprudence that was developed, but she said this is a step too far. You should exclude economic redevelopment takings from this kind of public use doctrine. Right? Justice Clarence Thomas just went the other way. He said all private takings should be off the table. Right? This is just uh, this is an area where you just don't go. And you know the arguments are pretty standard. If private takings are allowed, someone is going to find like a little loophole and make a case where it is appropriate to take land from one individual and give it to another individual, right? And the takings clause was for public use. It originally did not allow taking from Peter and giving to Paul, as they used to say, right? Now, um, what happened post Kilo is everyone saw how outrageous this was, right? And unlike the older cases, this was really, you know, Pfizer is not well loved in 2005, and that has a bit to do with it. So, you know, the media also turned a little bit on what was going on, and there was a huge backlash against Kilo after the verdict came out. And 45 of the 50 uh, states uh, passed statutes or passed laws and amendments intending to limit uh, public purpose and public use within their takings doctrine, right? Now, if you actually look at all 45 uh, laws that were passed, about two thirds of them do lip service, and really one third of them intend to limit the power of the state. But it's still a move forward from the immense breadth that has, you know, been seen in the public use doctrine in the United States. And this was one attempt to sort of roll it back. 
Now, after takings and what constitutes public use, the third aspect of the takings clause or the third limit is just compensation, right? You can't just take property. You have to give just compensation. Now, what constitutes just compensation? Now, on this, the courts have been really clear and extremely consistent. They say it constitutes fair market value. Right? And now again, your political economy students, how do you arrive at fair market value? Right? So typically what they do is they look at that particular area, right? You know, the way a real estate agent would find comparable property values and tell you to list your property, right? It's kind of a similar exercise. You look at, you know, the historical trend in that particular area, something very similar, how much it sold for, and then that's the fair market value. Now, if you think about this one step deeper, you know that this is not the fair market value for the individual involved, because if they thought that was enough for them to sell the property, they wouldn't have held out in the first place, right? So there is some additional subjective value that the individual um, attaches to that particular property. So that's one, you know, sort of like foundational conceptual problem with fair market value, but it's otherwise a pretty simple rule. There's a second major problem, especially when you look at these uh, economic redevelopment taking situations like Pole Town, especially Pfizer. Because typically what happens in economic redevelopment is fair market value depends on what your land is zoned for, right? If it's zoned for residential use, then that's one kind of market value. If it's zoned for commercial or industrial use, that's a different land market value. But all these redevelopments also are typically accompanied by a change in zoning regulation, right? So fair market value in the hands of the Pfizer redevelopment could be very different from fair market value when Suzette Kilo lives in that particular neighborhood. So now, which fair market value are we talking about, given that market prices are so strongly linked to the zoned use or the zoned purpose of that particular piece of land? Now, if we go by what all the uh, sort of uh, those favoring private taking say, they say there's going to be this huge surplus and economic benefit that is going to be generated, right? Now, the problem with using fair market value is that people like Suzette Kil Kilo are not going to be able to participate in the new surplus that is generated, right? That surplus is going to go entirely to Pfizer after the land is rezoned. So many critics, you know, if you take the ide ideological spectrum, both on the left and the right, if you take the analytical spectrum, you know, lawyers, uh, economists, sociologists, pretty much across the board, there are a lot of people arguing that fair market value is too low. So it should be higher than fair market value, maybe two to three times the fair market value, and then you are going to be able to split that surplus in some kind of a reasonable fashion, especially when it comes to economic redevelopment takings, right, private takings. So this is something that is yet unresolved because fair market value is very clean and simple, so American jurisprudence still sticks to the standard, right? So this is sort of the Cliff Notes version of what has happened in you know, about 200 years of uh, American takings clause. So I want to switch uh, gears and I want to move to India, right? And I want to give you the Cliff Notes version of what's happened in India. So there are lots of similarities. Both India and the United States have a written constitution, right? The dissimilarities, of course, India follows the Westminster system. America is the presidential system with stronger separation of powers. Both countries are federal, right? Both are democratic. Both have written strong Bill of Rights. And this is a, you know, you can do a case by case comparison, but basically the Indian constitutional framers, uh, they were drafting the constitution between 1946 and 1949. And the American constitution, especially the Bill of Rights was a huge influence. So you see the exact words appearing over and over again in the drafts that were circulated in the debates that they had in parliament and so on. And another thing India borrowed from the United States as opposed to from the British is independent judicial review, right? So the courts can actually take a look at statutes passed by parliament and invalidate them if they contravene with the constitution. So that's one other major similarity. Some, as you know, the Bill of Rights was brought in by amendment in the United States. It exists in the original constitution in India, right? Judicial review was brought in through judicial review and judicial interpretation in, um, uh, in the United States, whereas it is very much there from the beginning in the text of the Constitution in India. But barring that, they kind of had a similar starting point. They also had a similar colonial heritage, but there was one major difference. 
America wasn't as poor a colony as India was, right? And the colonial regime in America wasn't as extractive as it was in India, right? The second aspect was India already had its own feudal and monarchical system. It also had imposed upon that old structures like the caste system. There was an inherent inequality built into the Indian hierarchy at the time of independence. Now, what all those things amounted to were something that you see very similar to a Hawaii v. Midkif, which is 5% of the people in India own 95% of the land, right? And most people in India are landless farmers at the time of independence. This is a really major source of problem, both socially, because remember, you know, between 1946 and 1950, what's going on in the rest of the world? All sorts of revolutions. You might have read a thing or two about that too, right, in Chinese political economy. There was a huge fear that India is going to undergo a sort of Maoist-type revolution, and they're going to overthrow this newly minted constitution, newly minted government, and we need to do something about this problem, especially in a situation where, so India also introduced universal adult franchise from the first day, right? So all the people we're talking about have the right to vote, and they will vote. So if even if you talk within the realm of democratic politics, you've got to fix this problem of land use and land reform, right? It's kind of where we start. Now, when India ratified, uh, rather adopted, there was no ratification of the Constitution, the New York Times gave it like this glowing uh, editorial. It said, you know, this is a document everyone can be proud of, not just the British, not just the Canadians, especially the Americans, right? And the reason they say that is there is a very large influence in the Bill of Rights, the principles, writ jurisdiction, independent judicial review borrowed from America. But you know from reading even a little bit of American history that all these wonderful principles typically constrain the state, right? And if the state wants to go out and do some large-scale action like land reform, then it's going to be constrained in that, right? Now, the people who framed the Indian Constitution knew this. And they started debating this even when they were writing the Constitution, right? So they were mostly British-trained lawyers right, unlike uh, the framers and the founders of the American Constitution. And they said public use is too ambiguous. Remember, this is even before uh, Berman v. Parker, which is 1954, right? So th that case hasn't happened yet. They say public use is ambiguous, right? Does it mean only government use? Does it mean only public goods, right? Can it be used for large-scale land reform? And then they say, you know, that's a stretch. It's going to be very hard. You know, Hawaii hadn't happened yet, right? So they say it's going to be very hard to make the case that public use includes large-scale land reform, uh, dismantling the feudal system called the zamindari system. So we can't stay with public use, right? So what they do is they change it to public purpose. Something you see happen in 1954 by interpretation in the United States happens in 1949 in India in the text of the Constitution. So that's one big similarity right, that takes place. And uh, another aspect of what's going on in India is, unlike the United States, they adopt a socialist system, right? It was going to be a mixed economy where the government controls vast aspects of the economy and they have things like the five-year plan, which were modeled around the Goss plan of the Soviet Union. So there's a lot of government control over how economic resources will be used as well as distributed. So in this particular scenario, public use what does public use mean in a socialist environment, right? Now, when I was growing up in India, the government owned a bakery called Modern Bakery, right? Is baking bread public use? It's done by the state. What does that mean? But it could be public purpose in a country where they don't trust market prices to actually allocate bread efficiently, right? So that was kind of the outlook, why they changed public use to public purpose. The second question was compensation, right? And this was a really big issue. In America, at the time of independence, they didn't try large-scale land reform. Even cases like Berman v. Parker, you're talking about governments which are fairly well-funded or well-financed, right? Indian Treasury was virtually bankrupt at the time of independence. And if you say that all these, you know, maharajas and zamindars have to be given full compensation when we take their land and give it to the poor, it kind of defeats the purpose of large-scale land reform, right? You're just exchanging one kind of property for another. 
So there was this question of how do we deal with this? We don't want a revolution where people basically like, you know, march in and kill these zamindars and maharajas. We want some kind of constitutional regime, but simultaneously we can't pay them full compensation. And just compensation means fair market value, right? So they removed the word just and just compensation uh, became just compensation, like, you know, just, uh, just the word compensation, right? So that's what happened in India. So that's two major differences. And uh, lawyers wrote this, right? So this is the original takings clause in India. Uh, it's full of exceptions. It talks about details like when the, you know, the, the main thing is part one and two. The rest of it has a lot of details on when some of these statutes are passed. You know, is there a president who has already signed off on those statutes and so on and so forth. But I'm just going to give you the, the crux of it. That Part one, which says no person shall be deprived of his property save by the authority of law, right? Rings very similar to the American uh, takings laws. And second, no property shall be taken possession of or acquired for public purpose under any law authorizing the takings of such possession or such acquisition unless the law provides for compensation, right? So you see all the elements, right? What is a taking? Now we know a taking includes things like large scale land reform and socialist agenda. Right? We need due process, so you need to have some kind of authority of law, some statute that needs to be passed, which is also similar, right? What is public use doctrine? In this case, is public purpose, and you need a compensation regime. In this case, it is not just compensation, it's just compensation, right? So this is the starting point in India in 1950, which is what you get after a lot of cases in the United States. You see, you know, India starts a slightly different point. Now, there are some major problems in conducting land reform. There are these three cases. I'm not going to go into uh, too much detail. All of them are sort of, you know, you will see Raja and Maharaja in their titles. They're all sort of, you know, uh, feudal lords. Some of them are local monarchs. As you know, if you've read a little bit of British colonial history, the crown had all kinds of arrangements and treaties with local monarchs in India, right? These were like tax sharing arrangements. So there was a question of um, how do we implement this in a way that is constitutionally valid, but at the same time doesn't further privilege the already privileged, right? Especially those who've got their privileged or earned their privileged off the backs of colonial arrangements. So this was a major issue. Now what happened in these cases was the governments of Bihar, of Uttar Pradesh, of uh, Madhya Pradesh, Bharat, these are different states in India at the time. They passed statutes very cleverly where the compensation given to poor feudal lords or like, you know, smaller feudal lords was much higher than the compensation given to these Maharajas, right? In the case of Bihar, the statute said 20 times more compensation to the poor feudal lord versus the rich feudal lord, right? Because that's how you dismantle feudalism. Now, the problem is this didn't run afoul with the takings clause. It ran afoul with equal protection under the law, right? Another lovely provision we borrowed from the American Constitution. This is in Article 14 of the Indian Constitution. So all these statutes ran afoul with that, right? And uh, the Supreme Court of India, uh, the high courts at the time, this hadn't yet gone to the Supreme Court. The high courts sh shut down a couple of these cases, especially the Bihar law. Some of the other high courts took a slightly different point of view. And they said this, uh, you can't have this kind of land reform unless compensation is equal. But if you give equal compensation, you defeat the purpose of the exercise, right? So this is the kind of weird corner the government of India has painted itself into. So what they did was, once again, right, these are framers of the constitution. They're pending the first general election in India. They're trying to do the right thing constitutionally. But if they don't announce large-scale land reform, there's no way they can win elections. And there's no way they can govern a country like India, right? When 95% of the farmers do not own the land that they till. So this is a political problem as much as it's a constitutional or jurisprudential problem. So they decide that they'll amend the constitution. This is 15 months after the constitution is adopted. And they don't do all these things surreptitiously. They say, we're going to change the constitution because it's getting in the way of implementing land reforms, right? So when the constitution gets in the way of a statute, usually you get rid of the statute. Yeah, that wasn't an option. We are not in a position to get rid of the constitution, so we're going to accommodate it and we're going to change the constitution a little, right? 
So it says securing the constitutional validity of these laws, right? So two major changes happened. Actually, multiple changes happened. I'm going to focus on two. The first is they included a new provision in the Constitution called Article 31A, right? Which basically says that this kind of land reform or social welfare legislation, right, shall not be deemed to be void on the ground that it is inconsistent with or takes away or abridges any of the rights conferred by Article 14 or 9. Article 14 is equal protection under the law, right? So they basically say we're going to solve the problem that way, right? So Article 31A specifically talks about agrarian land reform. And it says we're going to solve this problem of you know, equal protection and equal compensation. There is a lovely provision that follows after this. You know, this is a just in case provision. Like, you know, we really need to get this done just in case there is some new litigation and there's a new problem. How are we going to fix it? This is my favorite provision in the Indian Constitution. I wrote my dissertation on it. That's how much I love it. It's called Article 31B. It created a new provision in the Constitution called the Ninth Schedule. And it said any law that you attach in the Ninth Schedule is completely protected from judicial review, even if it violates the Bill of Rights or fundamental rights. Right? So basically, the court is shutting down the laws, but the court is the messenger. Right? The problem is the constitutional constraints. But we will shoot the messenger, or rather quiet the messenger. How do we quiet the messenger? Any law that goes into this particular list right, is completely exempt from judicial review. I have never seen a provision like this in any other constitution, right? Uh, they started with 13 laws. Does anyone want to guess how many laws there are or statutes there are in the ninth schedule today? Google, right? No, don't bother. It's 282, right? So this obviously exploded and expanded. You can imagine why if you study, you know, like basic public choice rent seeking. So this was also introduced to protect or save land reform legislation, which the Constitution did not allow. Right? So clearly, the Indian government is going a slightly different way, but in part because it's trying to accomplish very different things than the American redevelopment of blighted neighborhoods and things like that. Right? Now, when you asked what constitutes public purpose in the American case, in the Indian case, remember, they're also socialist, right? There's a whole bunch of other takings going on. They nationalize bus routes, OK? And they say the state shall control or have a monopoly over bus routes. Now, any private bus operator obviously has lost his entire business, right? So now the question is, does this constitute public purpose, right? Another case is a textile mill. There was a problem between uh, the, the management and the labor in a particular textile mill. The government took it over because of some kind of social unrest problems, right? Does it constitute public purpose to take over a textile mill? Does it constitute public purpose to take over a bus route, right? And once again, the Indian judges do exactly what Justice Douglas did in Berman v. Parker, which is legislative deference. Whatever parliament says is public purpose, we believe is public purpose, right? So this is a way where the judges are both restraining themselves Right? Because they don't think that in a democratic uh, polity, judges should question if something constitutes public purpose when the representatives of the public have actually voted for something. That's kind of the reason or the logic behind this. But at the same time, if you apply the principle of legislative deference, you basically take away constraints because the court can no longer look into whether something satisfies public purpose or not, right? So if you guys came up to the court and gave your classic arguments about, hey, but there's rent seeking. Right? Nationalizing bus routes never saved anyone. Right? If you give your classic political economy arguments, the court will not get into it because they say, we don't question what is public purpose. We don't care if the outcome is public purpose as long as they mean it as public purpose. Right? Now, in these particular cases, again, these were like widely sort of litigated. So once again, the question came on what constitutes public purpose, what constitutes compensation. So you know the, the parliament sets about amending the constitution one, once again. They're like, you know, there's some confusion over what is the power of the government when it comes to taking property, when it comes to nationalizing bus truck. So we're going to clarify, right? Now, the next case is one on compensation, right? This is a redevelopment very similar to Berman v. Parker. This is West Bengal state redeveloping a particular area. They provide inadequate compensation, not fair market value, right? So it goes to the courts, and the courts say, 
we don't care if the word just is included before compensation or not. Compensation automatically means to make whole. And anything that the Constitution does has to have principles of justice and therefore needs to be just. So you have to give just compensation, right? So the Fourth Amendment says no, no compensation under any of these statutes can be called into question before a court of law, right? So the court can't tell you if something's public purpose. The court can't tell you if something uh, is the right compensation. So we slowly start limiting the purview of the courts, which also means removing constraints of the Bill of Rights. Right? This compensation issue was very persistent in India, unlike the United States. That's a major difference between uh, the two cases. So this issue of compensation, what qualifies as fair market value keeps coming up. What qualifies as just compensation keeps coming up. And not all the cases are similar. Right? Not all the judges in different high courts come up with the same outcome. So because it is so highly litigated, they finally decide to amend it again in the 17th Amendment in 1964. They say, you know, there's going to be all these issues. We're going to do two things. We're going to add 44 statutes to the ninth schedule. Remember, we started with 13, right? Then we added another seven. Now we're at another 44. So we're at 64 statutes by 1964, right? And the second is compensation, right? R.C. Cooper is a case, again, there's too much detail, but I'll give you the cliff notes. By now, Nehru has died. Mrs. Indira Gandhi is the prime minister. She has decided to completely go Soviet, right? She has said things in public like, my goal is to take India to the commanding heights, uh, to control the commanding heights of the economy. It's a very classic Soviet Union term. And controlling the commanding heights of the economy implies nationalizing a whole bunch of sectors like banking and insurance and mining and so on. So she sets about nationalizing these sectors. The first one is banks. She nationalizes them overnight by ordinance because if you do it properly, then you know all the funds will uh, disappear, right? Because funds tend to be fairly liquid and fluid. Um, so it's done overnight by ordinance. Of course, it's challenged. Now, the interesting thing about bank nationalization in India is it was 500 million rupees, which is not a small amount in that time. It did not give anywhere close to the actual compensation that was taken. And third, the compensation wasn't even given in cash. It was given in government bonds that matured after 10 years. Right? So now we're basically just taking over banks in return for like pieces of paper that may or may not mature in 10 years. So this was a major problem, right? So not just compensation, but what is the style in which compensation has to be given? Does it have to be money? Does it have to be cash? Is government bonds appropriate compensation? And we get into this whole thing, right? So once again, the government does what it does best. It amends the Constitution. The 25th Amendment says this word compensation has created lots of problems. We're going to delete the word compensation and replace it with the word amount. What is amount? The amount is whatever the government or that particular statute says the amount is, right? So now you see this different kind of slippery slope taking place here. Uh, after this, Mrs. Gandhi imposed the Indian emergency, which is basically suspension of democratic and constitutional rule in India for about 20, 22 months. And when she was asked about these policies by the New York Times, she says, we should be vigilant to see that our march to progress is not hampered in the name of the Constitution, right? Now, this is a very classic, like this was, it sounds a little bit funny sitting in the United States. It was like a normal thing to say in India. The constitution is preventing the government from all this social welfare agenda, such as bank nationalization, such as land reform, important socialist agenda that we really care about, right? So we need to resolve this problem and we do that by constitutional amendment, right? At one point, there's one of my favorite cartoons. I don't know if it's very clear for you. Someone goes to a bookstore, a government publication store, and says, may I have a copy of the Constitution? And the bookseller says, sorry, sir, we don't sell periodicals. <laughs> right? That is how often the Constitution was getting amended under Mrs. Gandhi's regime. Now, thankfully, Mrs. Gandhi's regime ended. We get a new prime minister. He's Morarji Desai. He's like, you know, Gandhian socialist reverses a lot of the damage that Mrs. Gandhi does to the Constitution, except on the takings clause, because socialist, right? Now, if you want to continue with the socialist agenda, you want to continue with nationalization, you want to continue with land reform, the takings clause is the villain. So what Murarji Desai does is he just deletes it. 
I, I'm not making this up. In 1978, uh, the Indian Parliament deleted the takings clause from the Bill of Rights uh, in the Indian Constitution, right? So if, if it doesn't exist, it's not a problem. So this was the 44th Amendment. They did it completely legitimately, by the way. All this was done like above board. They explain why they do it. And they say, which has been an occasion for more than one amendment, would cease to be a fundamental right. So what's the protection today? They included it as a legal right and not a fundamental right. It says no person shall be deprived of his property save the authority of law. What that basically means is it's the difference between executive action and legislative action, right? If any parliament or state legislature passes a law, that is fine, right? So only executive action can be challenged under Article 300A. So if the local municipal corporator takes your land without any kind of due process, then it can be challenged, right? But if parliament passes a law, or if the state legislature passes a law, you're totally fine. That's the, that's the broad distinction between the two, right? Now, a consequence of this is we get a lot of private takings not that dissimilar from Kilo and not that dissimilar from Pole Town, right? I call these reverse Robin Hood takings. The original set of takings for land reform were all Robin Hood takings, right? You take from the rich and you give to the poor. You dismantle the Maharaja system, you dismantle the Zamindari system. These are basically you're taking from regular folks, poor farmers, Right? You tell them that agriculture is no longer productive, your land is no longer as valuable in agriculture, we're going to give it to a paper mill. Right? We're going to give it to a technology park. Right? All these uh, you know, business processing call centers where when you call someone who sounds like me picks up the phone. Right? You need to set up those office parks. Now how do you find land for those office parks? We need to take land from farmers or small landowners and we need to build them. So now technology park redevelopment is permitted under this. Right? Same with residential developments. And India Pole Town happened in a town called Singur, right? Uh, Tata Motors wanted to put up a plant there. This also happened sometime in 2006, 2007. There were massive protests because they said this is a case where you're taking from poor farmers and giving it to Tata Motors, which by the way owned Jaguar at that point in time, right? Like, you know, it was just really not very good optics. And uh, they managed to kick them out by democratic protests because the law and the constitution no longer protect you, right? So they literally took to the streets. They were burning effigies of the car that the Tata plant was planning to manufacture in that area, and then they had to go to a different state of Gujarat, right? Now, there are a few lessons from what's happening in India, and then we'll, we'll go back to the US for a minute. So the first is legal formalism, and you know, constitutionalism in words or text is not the same thing as protecting rule of law and protecting individual liberty and rights, right? If you notice in India, you didn't get this kind of situation with some kind of tin pot dictator, right? At each stage, these things are debated in parliament. They go into detailed debates. I have read these debates. These are very smart people. So many of them British trained lawyers. They look at the text, they sweat over every word. They say public use, public purpose, compensation, fair market value. At each stage, they chip away just a little bit more. They do it using the correct procedure, which is constitutional amendment. But at the end of it, what you get is something that looks very different from constitutionalism and protection of rights, any rights, not just property rights, right? So the first is you've got to be a little bit more vigilant about um, textual and interpretational formalism. The second lesson is that we need to really think about ideology a little bit more carefully when we think of constitutional jurisprudence, right? The position has always been legislative deference, right? We are not gonna get into what constitutes public purpose, but what constitutes public purpose is always very tightly interlinked with two things. One is what is the government trying to accomplish? That is, what is the economic system that is prevailing there, right? Is it progressive? Is it socialist? Is it laissez-faire? Right? And in each of those cases, what is public purpose would be completely different. Right? And the second aspect of that is, if you think about ideology, right, most of these processes come up bottom up. Right? If people really care about reverse Robin Hood takings and they don't like the idea of taking from Suzette Kilo and giving to Pfizer, then their elected representatives hopefully will not engage in it. 
right? And these are two ways in which ideology really starts mattering, much more than what is the text of the Constitution. The text of the Constitution doesn't always bind, you know, ideology and government policy based on the prevailing ideology. And constitutions live for a long time. And the third is, uh, we need to rethink the fundamental role of government, right? And what I mean by this is, is the government best place to pick winners and losers? This is something that comes up in a big way again in Chinese political economy, right? Is the government best place to tell you where a town should be, right? Sometimes it picks winners and you get amazing special economic zone. Sometimes you get ghost towns in China because it has built up areas where literally nobody wants to live, right? So how good a job does the government do in these scenarios? That is something we got to think about, right? How good a job do the judges do? Are judges best place to look at a particular project and tell you whether there's economic benefit or not, right? In Pole Town, in Kilo, in all these cases, they told you massive amounts of tax revenue was going to show up in a few years. That tax revenue never came up, right? Those areas are still underdeveloped. But are judges best place to pick, pick winners and losers? And this is something we need to think about in addition to just, you know, what is the language? Because the people who are dealing with the language and interpreting the language really start playing an important role over a period of time. So we need new safeguards, right? And I've come up with three, and this will be very quick. Public use doctrine, procedural safeguards, and compensation. The same stuff we've been discussing all the while. Now, what about public use, right? This is a standard two by two matrix. Anyone who's taken a principles class knows this two by two matrix, right? You talk about what are pure private goods, which are excludable and rival. You talk about, you know, excludable non-rival goods, like, you know, the PDF I'm gonna send of this particular PowerPoint, right? These are not problem areas. We know the market resolves them fairly well, right? When it comes from a takings point of view. Now the problem is typically non-excludable or quasi-excludable and non-rival. Right? Those are sort of the major problems. So if something is non-excludable but rival, you get like public roads, public parks, right? Things that have congestion, but you can't exclude, right? Which means there's a certain public element to it because it's not excluded, right? Everyone's allowed to use it. And then there are pure public goods, which is, you know, your classic asteroid deflection, malaria prevention, national defense, you know, all of that stuff, right? So these are your, this is your standard matrix. Now, some people say, these are scholars like Richard Epstein, public goods is public use. Let's keep this really simple, right? So you limit your public use doctrine to public goods. And we know a public good when we see it, right? Even judges can see it. Even legislatures can see. And you can make a case if something's rival or non-rival, excludable or non-excludable, right? Another way to think about the same problem is make it based on end use, right? Not on the ownership. Right? So if it's public goods, it doesn't matter whether it's the state provider or the private provider, it's allowed. Right? If it's private goods, even if the government is running modern bakery, it is not allowed. Right? Now the problem with this is non-public goods, but those which are in public interest, like public libraries and universities, you know, those things are going to come into question now. Because those are not pure public goods based on end use and private providers provide it and the market provides it. So now you're getting into another zone, but this is another very clean way to restrict what's going on, right? Because we need some bright lines. So if you go based on end use restriction, you really only get pure public goods. But now we are agnostic to who the provider is, right? This is like your old 19th century American jurisprudence. So if it's a private railroad, it's totally fine, right? Now, there are some procedural roadblocks you can think of. That is, if you go with this economic development plan, you can ask for more procedural roadblocks. What is the plan, right? Will the title automatically change or Suzette Kilo gets to hold on to it and sell it to you after your plan has fructified, right? After you've built the first research facility, then we will give you the rest of the land, right? You know, you could have some serious procedural and structural roadblocks when you try and do this redevelopment of blighted neighborhood. What that does is a very classic, there's more skin in the game of private developers, right? So this is a different way of looking at safeguards, right? Again, when we're talking about plans and blueprints and convincing bureaucrats and convincing judges, there's a lot of political economy problems, but this is one other way that you could think about putting in safeguards. And a final one is increased compensation. 
right? We talked about this briefly when we were talking about fair market value and how fair market value is so tightly entangled with the zoned use, right? Now, if the redevelopment is gonna be so magical and increase revenue, right, is gonna have these great economic spillovers and then everyone will be rich and life will be wonderful, then why not give some of that surplus to the people on whose land and shoulders we are building this fantasy, right? Now, this is a way of both reducing holdouts because holdouts always are holdouts at a particular price, right? There's no such thing as a holdout without a price attached to it. So now, there's a new way of thinking about this problem, which is if you include people in the surplus sharing, right, that is another beautiful roadblock or a safeguard that you can put in because now the private party who's gonna be given or the government provider needs to fork out more money, which means they're not just gonna take property. I mean, there's, there's gonna be one more step that someone has to think about. So you're not gonna get cases like Pfizer where you've just taken the land and you know nothing's been built over 10 years and so on and so forth, right? Thank you. Questions for Shruti? Please. Is it true that sometimes, like in America, land can be given out as like an incentive for, let's say, Pfizer to come to uh, New London, with, and they don't need to commit legally to anything, and then they'll just turn around and sell the land at like whatever the market price is after getting it for free? I have heard this. I can't think of an instance of this, but more common than land or property is uh, tax incentives. Right? So what they'll do is they'll give tax incentives to these big firms and Walmart and everyone to come. And then Walmart and Pfizer will turn around and say, hey, but where are we going to build this facility? And that is typically when they sweeten the deal with, oh, we have a neighborhood where land is either available or we have a neighborhood we are intending to condemn. I mean, you know, uh, we could condemn. Uh, there could be a blighted neighborhood that you could redevelop and so on and so forth. I don't know if it's as naked as, hey, come here and we will give you land. I think there is a process, and it usually starts with tax and statutory in incentives, and then slowly, eventually, almost always goes to land, right? Land is also used in reverse to block it, right? For instance, I live in New York City. New York City people do not, I mean, I don't know if the people of New York, but the bureaucrats of New York definitely do not want a Walmart to come in, right? So the reverse is also true. You can push out a firm by changing zone and land use in a particular way that a particular kind of firm or a particular kind of economic activity is not allowed to come into that area. So I think governments tend to do both. Uh, I just don't know how like public and naked the, the incentive story is, but I've, I've heard this too, yes. Please. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, do you think that uh, with the sort of change in, in, in government over the last five years in India, um, and the INC being out of power, that there's more political will now for uh, liberal, liberalization in, in such areas as, as uh, takings. Um, and I, I, I don't know if the um, BJP government is, is saying anything about takings. If they are, um, what would, are, are they? So uh, this is a great question, a uh, slightly long answer. So the Indian Land Acquisition Act was a colonial act from the 19th century, right? And we had a few amendments by the post-colonial government, but that was basically the guiding statutes for, uh, for land acquisition. The, the government immediately preceding the BJP government tried to amend that particular law. And they did amend it, but uh, they did not put in a strong takings protection, because that's constitutional, not statutory, right? But they tried to put in some safeguards, but most of it was things like India needs to redevelop, right? There's a very state welfare and state leads economic development kind of attitude, which you're also familiar with studying China. So the idea is, you know, India's agricultural productivity is extremely low. We need to move to urbanization. We need to move to industrialization. And the people who are holding out are these farmers. Right? So five or six farmers holding out puts an entire a project into jeopardy, so we need to do something about it. That's kind of the attitude of the government. So what that particular land um, reform, uh, land acquisition law did was, it set parameters. It said if 80% people in a particular area agree that they are okay to give up their land for redevelopment, the last 20% cannot hold out. Right? So it did things like that. Uh, the BJP government tried to come and fix it, but land acquisition is just such a hot-button issue with 
farmers in India because they've been taken advantage of so many times in the recent past that, you know, the moment protests happen, it just walked away from the problem, right? So they, they, there was a lot of talk, you're absolutely right, there was a lot of talk of strengthening property rights, there was a lot of talk of making it both easier to resolve holdouts but harder to take advantage of farmers, but none of that really fructified. Small backstory to this. In India, farmers are dying to sell their land, developers are dying to buy land, but the transaction doesn't happen. And the reason for this is India does not have a regulatory takings regime, right? What we've done is, again, lots of socialist paternalist legislation says things like you can, uh, farmers cannot sell land to non-farmers. Right? This comes from the British East India Company fear. Someone from the outside will come and they will fool you and take your land and you know, take over the areas. So, you know, farmers, we need to protect the farmers, right? That kind of an attitude. Um, so what they did was, if you cannot change the land use of your particular land and you cannot sell to a non-farmer, that really depresses the value of your land. Whereas if there's a developer like Pfizer or Tata Motors where we're going to change the zoning of the law, we're going to invite them with a red carpet, right? We're going to change the land use and give it to them in a, in a lovely present. The value of the land is very high. Sometimes because of this kind of bad socialist regulation, the difference between land value in the hand of farmers versus the hand of the developer is 40x, right? So very often in India, the protests happen or the holdouts happen over price and over the share in the surplus value, right? Now, I'm sure there are some farmers who are holding out because they don't want to give up their land because they, you know, they care to till their land and so on and so forth. But very often, given that agricultural productivity is so low and farmers want to get out of it and their land holdings are so small, the reason they don't is always about price and the developers are trying to use the government to pay the farmers the lower price on a particular kind of land use and then they will get all the regulatory arbitrage. And you know, once the land use is changed, they'll get the higher price. Now, of course, there are a whole bunch of middlemen in this, right? Um, and, and we can talk more about who those middlemen are. We even know some names, and we know how they're connected to the government. But that's kind of the background of what's happening. So unless the BJP government fixes this mess, you know, which is all your land regulation mess, it's very difficult to fix the land acquisition or the takings mess, right? Because the political economy is entangled. Thank Those you. of you uh, considering graduate school, George Mason has a fantastic new graduate program in Truman, and we're very fortunate to have him become a great model. You've had a very unique form of training that you wouldn't get at other economics PhD programs, and we'd be happy to talk about that for periods. Um, one of the things that uh, was interesting about your talk is it almost seems in a way that the idea that rule of law is fundamentally inconsistent with socialism. At some point, one or the other has to be. And if, as long as India is socialist, rule of law will be subordinate. I mean, the idea is almost fiction in a way. And it's in China, which we'll discuss later in class, but this may be now, there is no independent judiciary. Yes. The judicial branch in China is a subsidiary yes. of the executive branch. And basically, judges uh, they carry out the wish of the executive using a type of rule of law that seems to be that. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about that perhaps in the Indian context. And the other question I had was, in China, an interesting legacy of Maoism is the fact that the federal the party, the party state in Beijing is not all powerful. The regional government yes. is tremendously powerful. Yes. And there's a lot of decentralization under Mao. I was reading the Coast of Wong book. And I was curious if that's similar in India too, that, um, that there is this tension between the national the federal government and the, the provincial governments and how they, and how takings are these are great questions. Thank you, John. So um, on the first aspect, like this was literally like the opening of my dissertation. Uh, it's very Hayekian, right, in a sense. So if you read Hayek's Road to Serfdom, uh, there's a big discussion there. And he's really talking to Fabian socialists, which is what the Indian framers were, like Nehru was a student of Harold Lasky and so on. And the road to serfdom is dedicated to British Fabian socialists, right? And one of the things that Hayek argues there is that there is this fundamental inconsistency between rule of law and this kind of socialism. And the reason is the kind of socialism we're talking about requires an enormous amount of discretion in the hands of the government, right? And it requires 
us to give an enormous amount of discretion in the hands of the government, especially for redistributive purposes, which automatically means you're going to treat people differently, as we saw in the Indian First Amendment's case, right? You're going to treat rich landlords differently from poor landlords and so on. Now, when you have that kind of a framework, rule of law requires you to have rules that are general, right? That are equally enforced on everyone, right? Generality, neutrality, lack of discretion, equal protection. These are sort of the pillars of rule of law, no matter what kind of system, sorry, no matter what kind of system you're in, whether it's the Westminster system, whether it's the, Brit uh, the US presidential system. And Hayek argued that there's an inconsistency between this kind of creeping Fabian socialism and restricting discretion, right? And that's sort of what you see, which is you, if you want the government to redistribute, right? You want the government to treat people differently. It is very difficult to do it within the sandbox of strong constitutional constraints, right? So if in your mind you think strong constitutional constraints equal strong rule of law, that's the American way of thinking, right? Like strong bill of rights, strong procedural checks, strong, you know, separation of powers equals constitutionalism equals rule of law. You're not going to get that when you have this kind of you know, Fabian socialism. So that's an absolute, you know, that's a very on point observation on your behalf. And you see that in Mrs. Gandhi's words, we must make sure that, you know, welfare is not hampered in the name of the constitution, right? So the constitution is the villain, right? The rule of law constraining the government is the villain. The government is trying to do something good by executing a socialist welfare agenda, by taking over banks which are not giving capital at sensible interest rates to poor farmers, right? By taking over land of uh, feudal lords who made treaties with the British colonial government. So this is a fundamental inconsistency. So there are a few chapters in The Road to Serfdom which are exactly on point on this. You can also read other rule of scholars like A.V. Dicey, right? The great British um, uh, scholar on administrative law and rule of law. And he also mimics this idea of you need generality, neutrality, lack of discretion, equality, and there are certain kinds of economic systems that just don't go well with that. Any government system that requires high degree of discretion, especially in economic purposes with the government, is going to run afoul with that. Now, coming to the difference between India and China, I've always held that China, what China is in reality and what it is on paper are very different and the same is true for India, right? But in opposite ways. Now, India is of the, of the constitutional framework federal, right? And China is not. But India is extremely centripetal in its federalism in the sense that it's, it's looking towards the federal government and its federalism. The reason for that is states can elect their own governments, but the federal government controls all the purse strings. So the federal government makes all the budget allocations, which means you are not really federal because there's no federalism without fiscal federalism, right? So it's a public finance problem as much as it's a constitutional problem. In fact, all constitutional problems are eventually public finance problems, some would argue, right? China, on the other hand, tends to be extremely decentralized with a lot of power with local, you know, sort of, uh, they're almost, in some sense, like local fiefdoms, uh, they are residual claimants of whatever is the wealth. Uh, I call them stationary bandit. Uh, no, but they're sort of like, you know, they're the residual claimants of the surplus that is generated in a particular area, right? And of course, nothing is true for all of China, just like nothing's true for all of India or all of the United States. But you see this a lot in some of the transition economy success stories in China. Right? So China tends to be much more decentralized in its decision making and you can appreciate that it's almost impossible to control a country and an economy as large as China by like a few people at the top, right? So you can, you can appreciate that difference, but it's de facto and de jure, it's very different. I believe de facto China has stronger property rights than India has, right? If you look at Chinese cases where uh, they're trying to take over farmland and redevelop it into something else, the farmers almost always get a share of the surplus value that I'm talking about. Right? And this is probably because the local uh, decision makers on the economic activity have a very good pulse on the situation and they know that this is going to lead to protests or this is going to lead to a problem which will make the regime look quite bad. Right? So de facto, very often Chinese farmers end up getting much better compensation in the scheme of things than Indian um, 
uh, farmers do. So in these, you know, senses, it's quite different. Uh, one more thing I would add, Chinese state capacity is at a different level than Indian state capacity, right? So and state capacity creeps into everything and it affects everything. It's not, it's the ability to build a road. It's the ability to build a bridge. It's the ability to actually target the areas that need to be targeted. It's the ability to correctly disperse compensation after land has been taken, right? It's the ability to have proper land titling. All of those things are extremely weak in India. All of those things are far uh, superior in China. Like Chinese state capacity is at a, at a much, much, much more advanced level. Maybe they're like 30, 40, 50 years ahead. So I think these are some of the differences. Uh, so in one sense, China can actually execute urban redevelopment. Of course, when they do it that well, sometimes you get ghost towns, right? The city is completely built, but no one went there. In India, the city would not be built at all. Right? So it won't look like a ghost town, it just look like something, right? But the lack of state capacity is visible both in the success stories and the failure stories in China. I think you had your hand up. Um, sorry, yes. I mean, I was just thinking that it's the, what we talked about in class, that it's the rule of bylaw rather than the rule of law, right? Yes. Just pass whatever law you want. Absolutely. I mean, if you can just change the constitution anytime you feel like it, I mean, there's no law constitution. Absolutely. And uh, I will say that, you know, I mean, India is not, I think, as badly off as ruled by law, you know, because in one sense, there is a constitution. It is a little bit more difficult to amend the constitution than pass, you know, regular statutes. Uh, it's harder to pass regular statutes than an executive decree and so on and so forth. So, you know, if you think about like the costs imposed or the constraints imposed on the political decision makers, it's a little bit more burdensome, but you're absolutely right that, you know, we have a lot of rule by formal law as opposed to rule by actual law, right? Which is the principles of law versus the, the statutory or the executive decree. India basically runs on notifications. Right? The government will decide something, it'll put it in nice print, it will notify the actual authority, it will be done, it looks very legal and proper, but actually it completely violates the principles of law. So that's, a, that's an excellent observation. One more question? Please. Uh, given that it sounds like there's some comfort of altering the Constitution or working around it in places where it doesn't actually need to be listened to. Um, do you have any instinct on the stability and the longevity of that Constitution? To what extent it has staying power? There's a great literature on this, and uh, the people to read on this are like scholars like Tom Ginsburg at Chicago. They basically talk about the rigidity of a constitution versus the longevity of the constitution. And the American constitution is really an outlier in terms of how difficult it is to formally amend the text of the constitution versus how long it has survived. Typically, if it's very difficult to amend a constitution, it completely breaks down, right? Because people are not on board with these kinds of constraints. And at the end of the day, the legislators don't perfectly mimic the preferences of the people, but to some extent that they do. Right? On the other hand, if it's too easy to amend the constitution, then it's not really a constitution. So those are cases of extreme longevity, like the British system, which doesn't have an actual written constitution, which has a procedure to amend that written constitution. It's a bunch of statutes held together, but there's parliament sovereignty, right? Which means that we can actually change the rules slowly, quickly, any point in time. We're not bound by the constitution, but on the other hand, it makes the system extremely flexible, and you know, very, very long lasting. Even things like the Magna Carta that everyone thinks is the British constitution has only three of the 63 initial clauses surviving or still in effect, right? So in some sense, there's been an evolution. So if it's very easy to change something, right? It could last longer because people will hold on to it and make it a living constitution and change it when they want. Uh, on the other hand, if it's very rigid, they won't. So this is a complicated question. It's very difficult to find that line. There are excellent economic models on this, starting with the canonical model by James Buchanan. This is a book by Buchanan and Tulloch called The Calculus of Consent. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a thought experiment or a model on how people would get together and actually write a constitution and what are the kinds of uh, costs or constraints they are worried about in choosing a particular set of rules and binding themselves. 
right? So if decision-making costs are extremely high, you have a very low voting group, right? Whereas if you're paranoid and nobody trusts each other, like the five families in the mafia or something, right? You have very, very high uh, voting majority requirements. That's, that's one. The other thing I want to say about that is it feels like the American Constitution is very rigid to amend, but that is true only of the formal text of the Constitution. The American Constitution is rewritten every day. It's rewritten every summer by the Supreme Court, right? So most of the amendment con uh, American constitutionalism, as we call it, is developed by the court, right? It is even the takings clause. The Indian takings clause has been changed so many times and then deleted. There has not been a single change to the American takings clause since its ratification in 1791. And yet it reads so remarkably differently from where you started, right? So we've got to also be careful about that. Uh, I have a paper on this and I can send it to you where I talk about interest groups trying to you know, change the constitution and they do what any interest group would do, which is forum shopping. Right? If it's very difficult or prohibitively expensive to amend the text of the constitution, you go to the judiciary. Right? And if the judiciary is like the Indian judiciary imposed a lot of constraints, you go to parliament or the legislature to change it. So there is no way out past a point if changing the constitution is going to give such large benefits to a small minority of well-organized people, you are going to get constitutional change. The only question is the, uh, what kind of form is it going to take and which forum will that constitutional change be played out in? Like that's the big question, right? right? But there's a huge literature on comparative constitutionalism and sort of the longevity of constitutions. I can't remember the name of the book, but the authors are Ginsburg, Melkin, Melton, and Elkins. And this is uh, Chicago. It should have come out in the last six or seven years. So if you Google it, you'll be, you'll be able to find the book. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you very much.